Good morning and welcome into Metro News Talk Line on this Thursday morning. I'm Shauna Johnson filling in today for Hoppy Kerchival and we're underway. Do not attempt to change the station. You are surrounded. We interrupt this program to bring you an emergency news bulletin. Repeat, this is an emergency bulletin. Keep your radio turned on. Turn on. Holy smoke. From the studios of the West Virginia Radio Corporation and the Metro News Radio Network, the voice of West Virginia, comes the most powerful radio show in West Virginia. This, this is Metro News Talk Live with, with Hoppy Kerchival. Check set light up like that. Activated, Activated Telos Telephone. Switch, Switch network, network control from Charleston, from Charleston to Morgantown. Stand by. Q Hoppy, you're on. <laughs> Good morning to you and welcome in to Metro News Talk Line here on the Metro News Radio Network in and around West Virginia on a rainy Thursday, at least in Charleston. Also streaming online at WVMetroNews.com, WVMetroNews.com. My name is Shauna Johnson. I'm filling in today for Hoppy Kerchival, who is on vacation. Hoppy returns to his program coming up on Monday morning. Ahead on the show today, we will go to Marshall University, where this hour, the bells on campus are ringing 10 times. Ringing 10 times as a tribute to late Marshall President Stephen Kopp, who died from a heart attack a year ago today. We'll talk with interim Marshall President Gary White later on in the show. Also this morning, I'd like to introduce you to a couple of educators in Upshur County who are starting at the elementary school level with kids in grades K through five, starting at that level to get them thinking about careers in colleges. We know the Higher Education Policy Commission and also the West Virginia Community and Technical College System have set a goal of doubling the number of college degrees earned in West Virginia within the next 10 years. In Upshur County, they are starting early. We'll go there later on in the show. Also, we'll talk a little bit with Shepherd University's Director of Athletics, as Shepard prepares to play in the Division II National Football Championship game coming up on Saturday, a game you'll be able to hear right here on the Metro News Radio Network. It seems like this time of year, Hoppy's always on vacation at this exact time, so I'm hosting the show. So it's become a bit of a tradition to look for the release of the report from the American Tort Reform Association on judicial hellholes in the United States. The foundation has today issued its judicial hellholes report, naming courts in California, New York City, Florida, Missouri, Illinois, Louisiana, Texas, and Virginia among the nation's most unfair in their handling of civil litigation. Where is West Virginia on this list? For that, we bring in Tiger Joyce, the president of the American Tort Reform Association. Good morning to you, Tiger. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Shauna. Good morning. Thank you for having me on. I think it was this time last year. It might have been a year earlier. I said you could call back when you had some good news. So where is oh, <laughs> where is West Virginia on this judicial hellhole list today? Well, I'm happy to say we do have good news. It's good news thanks to the good people in West Virginia, uh, the voters, the citizens who've uh, I think heard our uh, our, our uh, suggestion, uh, strongly hinted suggestion. Uh, that, that problems with the civil justice system in the state are such that they really need to pay attention to them and and uh, and affect some change. And uh, we're really pleased under the leadership of uh, Senate President Bill Cole and Speaker Tim Armstead and your governor, uh, Governor Tomlin, signing uh, a number of very significant pieces of civil justice reform legislation have have really changed the the whole perspective for us. Uh, West Virginia, which for every year was the only state in the uh, judicial hellhole report since it began, is now no longer a judicial hellhole. We've taken it off the list. Um, we have been saluting uh, not just your legislative leaders, your governor, also Attorney General Morrissey, uh, the, and all the good work that they've done. Um, we're, we couldn't be more pleased with, uh, with how they have done. Um, that said, the, it, it, West Virginia is still in the report. We've put it on what we call our watch list, and we mm-hmm. do that because 
what we expect will happen in West Virginia, as we've seen around the country, is that in the aftermath of significant legislative reform, there will be judicial challenges to uh, significant parts uh, of, of the uh, reform agenda uh, in the courts. Uh, and that's, uh, that's an open question. And I think watching what the courts do will really determine whether this is a, 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 a long-term fix to, to a, what's been a long-term problem uh, or whether it's something that's just un, we, when it's just a blue screen. We certainly hope uh, that, that the, the court will be respectful uh, of the perspectives of your legislature, uh, your governor who signed these bills into law, uh, and, and recognize that these reflect uh, balanced uh, uh, reforms uh, that reflect the, the priorities of, of the citizens of the state and bring about needed reform. And, 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 and I would add that, that as, the, as, as your lead, the leaders in your state uh, are, are responding to uh, the economic challenges that, that obviously are, are take, take place outside of the courtroom. Uh, they're, they're, the evidence is overwhelming uh, that having a balanced system is a way to enhance economic development and to attract jobs, something I know that's important in your state. What would be one or two of the key pieces of legislation you think that led to West Virginia being taken off this list? Well, that, you know, it's that, it's a little bit, Shauna, like trying to pick who's your favorite child. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there there were there was reform of punitive damages, uh, uh, limits on medical liability, uh, dealing with some of these abuses in asbestos litigation. I have to mention, and this is something we've also applauded uh, uh, the, the 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 citizens of the of West Virginia who served on a jury uh, in a in an asbestos case in which. Some of the worst fraud was exposed in a case brought by CSX, Transportation, the railroad company, several years ago uh, against a, a law firm that had engaged in outright fraud. And it was a civil uh, racketeering uh, case, and CSX uh, collected over $7 million, which it donated to, ch to its own charity. Um, but, the, you know, the, the asbestos litigation has been a big, certainly been a big problem. Uh, there was a decision uh, having to do, uh, I think it was a 2013 uh, West Virginia High Court decision uh, dealing with what you would call sort of, you know, open and obvious dangers that, you know, you should be mindful uh, of those. Uh, and and uh, a law was enacted uh, to restore uh, the rule that, you know, that if you're a property owner, you're not subject to liability for what should be readily and apparently an open and obvious uh, danger. Um, so those are just some examples, along with being one of the first uh, in the country to uh, uh, to enact reasonable reforms uh, to the state's uh, consumer protection statute, so that it serves its appropriate function and isn't used as a as a new way to uh, dramatically expand liability uh, against defendants uh, in a way that it was never intended. We're That's talking with. Say. It's like picking, like picking my favorite child. It's hard for me to do. Well, I was reading down through the list of the list of the legislation cited in the report today from the American Tort Reform Association, and it's not the best legislation to describe on the radio, but we'll give it a shot. We're talking with Tiger Joyce, president of the American Tort Reform Association. Tiger, I've been getting calls throughout the morning from people who say. This report has been discredited multiple times. West Virginia should have never been on this list in the first place. What would be your response to that? Well, this is a report. Uh, you know, how do you dis discredit a report? I think in a way it would be like discrediting, discrediting an editorial. Uh, we believe that we have a perspective that we source. We back it up with a lot of, uh, a lot of information. Uh, people, reasonable people can disagree. Um, you know, reasonable people could say we don't belong there. That's fine. Let's have that debate. Let's discuss these particular issues. If you believe uh, that, that, the, that, that the, there shouldn't be uh, enhanced transparency uh, in how plaintiff's lawyers uh, bring asbestos claims and protect legitimate claims uh, and, and, not, and prevent double dipping, in other words, suing a, a, a company on the one hand to recover for an individual and then suing a, someone else uh, from a bankruptcy trust, 
without having to disclose any of that, without any, any, you know, that's your perspective. I think that's wrong, but we would respect that view. But this, that's what this is. This is, we collect a tremendous amount of information. We analyze, put down our opinion, and we make our best case. Some people may not agree. That's certainly their perspective. How important? And, and they're right to be that way. Well, Will West Virginia remain on this watch list until something is done, possibly on an intermediate court of appeals? I, I think that that's certainly, I understand that's something that may be considered this coming year. We would see that as an as extremely uh, positive development. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll just have to kind of, mo- we'll, we will monitor developments in the state. Uh, you know, we, I think the real question will be, is there a confidence level uh, that the that the judiciary, not that it needs to necessarily rubber stamp everything, but needs to needs to analyze and and, and evaluate litigation challenges uh, uh, to these statutes in a way that properly respects the prerogatives of the legislature and the governor to make make policy for the civil justice system. Tiger Joyce, president of the American Tort Reform Association, thank you for your time this morning. West Virginia no longer a judicial hellhole in this organization's view. I appreciate your insights. Thank you very much. Coming up next hour, Senate President Bill Cole and House Speaker Tim Armstead are going to have a news conference. They're going to be talking about the release of this report today, talking about some of the legislative steps that were taken to get to this point, what I would consider... A victory lap on their part. Not everyone has the same view, though. Coming up next, we'll bring in the West Virginia Association for Justice to see what they have to say about this report. Also, your calls at 1-800-765-8255, 1-800-765-TALK. Or you can send a tweet. Tweet me at Shauna JWV, at Shauna JWV. What do you think about the American Tort Reform Association saying, for the first time since starting this judicial hellhole list, West Virginia is no longer a judicial hellhole? Hoppy Kirchival had said last week that West Virginia should become off the list, and that's what's happened. So what do you think? Give us a call, send a tweet, and we'll continue with you and with the West Virginia Association for Justice coming up next. Tis the season to start saving. At MVB Bank, it's easy with our new 12-month CD. Start earning 1.15% annual percentage yield with a minimum deposit of just $1,000. To start your CD savings today, visit our jolly team at any MVB location or call us at 844-MVB-BANK. It's sure to keep you off the naughty list next year. MVB Bank, your financial life made easy. Member FDIC. It's here, the year-end blockbuster sales event at your central West Virginia Jeep Giant. Northside Chrysler Jeep Dodge Ram Trucks in Summersville. Inventory is huge, and so are the savings. Come on in now for this deal, a 2016 Jeep Cherokee Latitude 4x4 Cold Weather Group. Yep, you're going to need it. Satellite radio, retail price $29,230, blockbuster price $24,999. You save over $4,200. It's only the beginning. See us in person or online at northsidewv.com. For generations, West Virginia hospitals have cared for our communities in every way, carrying the promise of help, hope, and healing. Just as our families have grown, so have our hospitals, advancing programs to improve the health of all West Virginians. They're the place you turn in your time of need for healing, compassion, and professional care. West Virginia hospitals, generations of community growth for generations to come. A message from the West Virginia Hospital Association online at wvha.org. You're listening to TalkLine on Metro News. For 30 years, the voice of West Virginia. Statistics show that 80% of auto fatalities occur close to home on rural roads. Cops. That's why law enforcement is stepping up rural patrols and cracking down on impaired driving. If you are over the limit, you are under arrest because drinking and driving don't mix. Remember, over the limit, under arrest. This message brought to you by the Governor's Highway Safety Program. 
At MVB Bank, we have one simple objective, to give you the very best of everything you could possibly want and need in a bank. That's it. We believe most people just want a really great bank with top-notch products, like checking with cash back, nationwide ATM fee refunds, great CD and car loan rates, and more. Together with our awesome team and the convenience of state-of-the-art technology they can count on. It's no extra fluff, just good, honest banking. We're MVB Bank, your most valuable bank. Member FDIC. You're listening to Metro News Talk Line here on the Metro News Radio Network on this Thursday morning. I'm Shauna Johnson in today for Hoppy Kerchival. Hoppy's on vacation. He returns on Monday morning. Coming up in the program, the sounds of It's a Wonderful Life. Right now, though, we're talking about today's report from the American Tort Reform Association saying that West Virginia, and this is the association's word, has heroically escaped its perennial hellhole past with major reforms. West Virginia is no longer on the list of judicial hell holes in the United States. The state is on a watch list, though, because as we heard from the association president, Tiger Joyce, just a moment ago, there are still some additional reforms needed in their view. And also they wanted to wait to see how some of these legal reforms take effect, dealing with allocating fault, the potential for excessive punitive damage awards, limiting medical liability, abuses in asbestos litigation, some changes to the consumer protection law, among other things that came out of the legislature. Paige Flanagan is the president of the West Virginia Association for Justice, which represents plaintiff's attorneys. Paige, you're not at all happy about this development, are you? No, Sean, I'm not. And, and thank you for the opportunity this morning to be able to um, address your listeners. You know, we have been on this list for over a decade. And so being on a watch list is really no different than being listed as the judicial hell hall. Um, it continues. Uh, we've been on this list for over 10 years. Every year they say, okay, do this. Then, then we'll change you, and then you can come off the list. Those changes are made. The next year, well, you need to do this. And, and APRA is like a bully. They keep, keep coming back year after year after year. Um, they tell you they want you to do something, and then you can come off the list. Do they take you off the list? No, we're still on a watch list. We're still on the list. But it's like a bully. You know, the legislature and the people of West Virginia keep reacting to this, and it's time to stand up and say, okay, enough is enough. You know, the trial lawyers are the protector of the rights of the Constitution. They are the protector of the rights of the people. ATRA, on the other hand, is the protector of the corporations and their profits and limit, limiting when they can be held accountable for their actions. Um, and enough is enough. The only way you can deal with a bully is my mom and dad taught me from a very young age to stand up to them. And it's time to stand up to them. <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to dismiss the report, though, when you have leading lawmakers like Senate President Bill Cole and House Speaker Tim Harmstead. They're going to be talking next hour about this report. I mean, they've certainly legitimized it. They're listening to what this association says. Well, they're listening to them because what they want to do is they want to be able to continue in power. Okay. And one of the things that they want, and if, if you look at the, at the wording very carefully, you can really see what being on the watch list is all about. And they want to say, okay, you know, particularly they refer to the West Virginia Supreme Court as the state's sole appellate court. Mm -hmm. What they're doing by using that language is pandering for more legislation, particularly an appellate court. It's what the chamber wants. It's what Kayla wants. It's what ATRA wants. Well, that's going to cost this state ten million dollars and that's ten million dollars that we don't have because they're making 16 million in cuts to secondary education over 16 million in cuts for higher education and you know our teachers and our state employees 
are suffering because of the cuts to PEIA and the legislature just says, well, we don't have the money. Well, if we don't have the money to take care of our children, to be able to educate them, to be able to provide to higher education, then why do we need $10 million to fund something that we don't need? It's a waste of tax dollars, and it's a waste of the resources and adds a layer of government we simply do not need in the state. It sounds like you think the intermediate appellate court proposal will get more traction in the upcoming legislative session. I think that's exactly what Bill Cole wants. Um, and I think that's what he's after. They want another bite at the apple for corporations when they get sued and they can't be held accountable. They want them, you know, if they don't get their way and in trial court and they lose, they have a right to appeal to the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. But they want a yet another pushdown method. Well, I attended joint meetings of the Judiciary Committee in interim, and Senator Romano asked the head of the Supreme Court, one of the Supreme Court justices of, of Nevada, um, and they have what's called a, a pushdown model, and mm-hmm. that's what they want to model with that. Well, when he looked and had the, was provided the information that this court really don't have a significant backlog, how they're dealing with our cases and what our financial picture is, Even the Nevada Supreme Court agreed that we don't need it. And so if we don't need it and we can't afford it, why are we doing it? Paige Flanagan, president of the West Virginia Association for Justice, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate it. So two very different views of where West Virginia is right now in terms of civil litigation. What do you say? 1-800-765-8255, 1-800-765-TALK. Also tweet me at Shauna JWV, at Shauna JWV. Let's go to Ron right now. Ron, you don't so much want to talk about this. What, what's your concern this morning? Sean, I heard you a couple of days ago ask the head of the school building authority, the state school building authority, whether the the funding of the consolidated Ravenswood High School and Ravenswood Middle School result in sixth graders walking the same hallways as 12th graders. First, thank you for asking that question. Point of fact is, and I hope a lot of people in Ravenswood are, are listening to this today to learn this, you can go to the SBA site right now and see that of the 18 classrooms that the new middle school would have, eight of them would be in the existing high school. Nearly half the middle school class, classrooms would be in the existing high school. That's what's being called a new middle school. I think it should be called a new middle half school. Thank you, Ron, for the phone call. Ron referencing there the funding decisions the State School Building Authority made earlier this week, and Jackson County was on that list. You can read more about that project at WVMetroNews.com, WVMetroNews.com. I was just wondering, I had asked David Sneed about that because I was, I was wondering how it was going to work with the students being in that school, the middle schoolers and the high schoolers. We're going to take a break here for the bottom of the hour. When we come back, we'll talk about the Handle with Care initiative. Also, later in the hour, we're scheduled to speak with Shepherd University's Director of Athletics as the Rams prepare for Saturday's Division II National Championship game. Right now, the State Board of Education is meeting, and we are expecting a vote this morning on new education standards in West Virginia, the college and career readiness standards, the replacement basically for Common Core. We'll get into that later. This is Talkline on Metro News for 30 years, the voice of West Virginia. It's 1030. Time for a news update. For that, we go to the Metro News Anchor Desk in Charleston for the latest on this Thursday. West Virginia Metro News, I'm Shauna Johnson. It'll be well over a dozen years at least before the Pleasance County man who killed his former girlfriend's one-year-old daughter, injuring her while babysitting in 2014, is eligible for parole. 31-year-old Curtis Richards Jr. from St. Mary's was sentenced to the maximums for murder and larceny on Wednesday in Wood County Circuit Court. A deadly crash in Hampshire County. Three people are dead following a head-on collision in Hampshire County, according to a press release from West Virginia State Police at about 4 p.m. yesterday afternoon. Emergency crews were called out to a two-vehicle crash on Route 28 near Buffalo Hollow Road. A vehicle driven by Margaret High was heading northbound on Route 28 when she crossed the center line of the roadway while negotiating a right-hand curve and hit another vehicle heading southbound, driven by Michael Stewart head-on. Both High and her passenger, Samuel High, were pronounced dead at the scene. Stewart was pronounced dead a short time later at Hampshire Memorial Hospital. 
I'm Amanda Mangan, WVMetroNews.com. Nearly two dozen state police troopers in Mercer, McDowell, and Wyoming counties will soon be trained in the use of naloxone, an opioid overdose reversal medication. U.S. Attorney Booth Goodwin. This is an area that's been particularly hard hit, and this is a, a development that should be very, very welcome in that area. Community Connections is providing grant money to pay for the naloxone kits. And it'll be a busy night at movie theaters throughout West Virginia with the opening of Star Wars The Force Awakens. You're listening to Metro News for 30 years of Voice of West Virginia. There are things that make our lives easier. You know, locking shoelaces, pizza scissors, remote control mops, one-hand bottle cap openers, and the no-before-you-go driving app. It's free travel information on West Virginia highways, traffic congestion, work zones, road conditions, information that can make your travel easier. Log on to WV511.org or download the WV511 Drive Safe app. No before you go. It'll make your life easier. A a study from England shows that men, men spend more time each day looking at themselves than women. Well, believe that study or not, the point is we all want to look our best all the time. Well, the same holds true for businesses. We judge businesses, in fact, by their look. At Pikewood Creative, we produce videos and commercials that make businesses look their very best. And you know what? It improves their business. They get more customers and clients. If you'd like your business to look better, then check us out at pipewoodcreative.com. The CEO of CityNet says a recent court ruling ordering Frontier to allow CityNet to utilize unused fiber optic cable is going to help CityNet get into more rural areas. What that does is that it now enables CityNet to provide more advanced telecommunication services in the various markets that we were able to get this fiber. Jim Martin says CityNet can now connect fiber optic routes from Clarksburg to Philippi and from Clarksburg to Buchanan to Elkins. From the Metro News Anchor Desk, I'm Shauna Johnson. You're listening to Metro News Talk Line here on the Metro News Radio Network on radio stations throughout West Virginia. Also streaming online this morning at WVMetroNews.com, WVMetroNews.com. An update from today's meeting of the State Board of Education. Board members are getting an earful this morning from delegations out of Fayette County. They're criticizing the members of the board who serve on the school building authority those who voted against Fayette County's proposed school consolidation plan. So right now, board members hearing from delegations that may delay today's vote on the new standards set to replace next generation or common core. You know these education standards dealing with what students are learning in West Virginia. There was much debate about common core next generation. The recommendation is to repeal those education standards and put in place these new college and career readiness standards for English and math. We'll keep you updated on what the State Board of Education does with that, if it happens, before noontime today. Right now, I want to tell you about Handle with Care, an initiative developed by the West Virginia Center for Children's Justice. And it started in Charleston, a system for Charleston police officers to notify schools in the county when children witness a traumatic event at home, like drug raids. Those schools then provide additional support and counseling to those students. Dr. Carol Smith is a member of the American Counseling Association and part of the West Virginia Defending Childhood Initiative. She's also an associate professor of counseling at Marshall University. She's worked to involve licensed professional counselors in this effort, and she joins us this morning here on Metro News Talk Line. Dr. Smith, good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Could you just explain to those listening how Handle with Care works? An example, something happens at a home and then what? Sure. Um, Very briefly, um, uh, for instance, uh, referring to the head, the news that you just had on before this show about the head-on collision in Hampshire County. Mm-hmm. Um, say those were parents of uh, elementary age children, and they got a notification that this horrible thing had happened in their lives. Uh, the notification would go also to the children's school in a confidential way, not saying any of the details, 
but just saying that something has happened and those children need to be handled with care. And that's a phrase that's actually used in the notification, handle with care. So if they show up and there's no so, homework or they right. don't have a dues of some sort, they would, they would be given a little bit of a pass. Exactly. That's exactly what happens. So the children, instead of being treated with um, discipline, would be treated with compassion. So in the, the teachers would know to say, instead of um, what's wrong with you, they would ask what has happened, what has happened to you. Um, and the, the Handle with Care program is a little bit bigger than just the notification. Um, it involves the teachers and administrators at the school learning how to create a more safe and secure school environment but also knowing when to refer a child for counseling either within the school or if they need additional counseling to bring counselors into the school to provide counseling to the child during the least disruptive time in the school. Am I right that right now it's in Charleston only in West Virginia, Handle with Care? That is correct, although it is expanding very, very quickly. Uh, we piloted the program in a couple of schools in Kanawha County, and the police officers who were originally involved um, quickly realized that they had to include some, of, some other schools. We started out with two, and then we ended up with, I think, five different schools in Kanawha County who were part of the pilot, because what would happen to one child would happen to their siblings as well, and maybe they went to different schools because of their age, the age differences. Um, so it, it started out in Kanawha County. It's now in Cabell County, and I have a map around here somewhere, five or six other counties within West Virginia, and there are about 11 to 20, I'm guessing, counties who have expressed interest in getting the training, and we're in the process of rolling out this Handle with Care initiative statewide. It's like drinking out of a fire hose. It's just amazing. Yeah, I think I saw this morning Wood County officials got some training on it maybe yes. on Wednesday. Yeah, I wrote yes. that note down. Now, this effort, when President Barack Obama visited Charleston earlier this year, Charleston Police Chief Brent Webster talked about it, and the, it got the president's attention. So do you see this rolling out nationwide eventually, Handle with Care? It sure did. I'm so glad that Officer Webster uh, did mention that to President Obama, and I'm just thrilled that President Obama had ears to hear it and, and say, hey, wow, something this, this sounds good. Let's see what comes from this, and, and maybe it can be a national model, uh, and we're delighted with that. And we are getting lots and lots of phone calls from lots of states. Um, we've even gotten a couple of phone calls from Canada um, uh, we being the Center for Children's Justice, not me personally. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, people are really excited about this because it's a very small shift in a paradigm shift in the way we look at our, the children in the schools and how we can support their learning by supporting the whole child. And it seems as simple as you're just closing the gap a little bit between what may be happening at home and what's happening in school. It's not, se it's not separate locations. Absolutely. And here's, here's the thing that's why it's so important. Children who have been exposed to trauma, a traumatic event, they tend to shut down cognitively. They can't help it. It's just a, um, a survival response. They shut down emotionally and cognitively. So they come to school the next day and they're in a daze. They're not focusing. They're hypervigilant. They can't put anything into words. Their face even goes blank. They don't draw any attention to themselves, and it's really, really easy for them to fall through the cracks. Either that or they act out <clears throat> and are really difficult to handle because of the stress they're carrying and do incendiary kinds of things in school, get people's attention, and end up being disciplined, only adding to the problems. You're addressing the behavior, not the reason for the behavior. Right, right. And it's really, really easy for us as adults to just react to the behavior. It's so easy to just react to the behavior. And this training helps us to wait just that nanosecond to say, wait a second, what's behind the behavior? What might be going on in this child's life? How can we be part of the solution instead of part of the problem? I guess, how do counselors respond? Are there enough counselors for this effort? Or is it adding to their job? Or is it some, something that's already available in the school system? 
you're asking really, really good questions. It's a, I know, um, it's a really big question. So it is. Just generally. And it's, it's, this is a huge. This is a huge initiative, and the handle with care piece sort of drives a wedge into a larger log, so to speak. And as we're splitting the log open, we're realizing we've got a lot of work to do. Um, the answer to the first question is: Are there enough? Are there enough counselors? There are counselors, school counselors, in every school in West Virginia. Does it add to their workload? Yes and no. In some ways, it adds one more thing to think about, but in other ways, if we think about it proactively, it may actually lessen the workload because we'll have less behavioral incidents in school. Dr. Carol Smith, the Handle with Care Initiative, do you have a parting thought or something you want people to know or to hear about this? You know, it, it, it's going to take all of us. Uh, trauma is not just a mental health issue. It's a public health issue. And we need to be just so much more aware of what's going on behind the behaviors that drive us crazy. Dr. Carol Smith, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it this morning. You're very welcome. Have a great day. She's a member of the American Counseling Association, also part of the West Virginia Defending Childhood Initiative and an associate professor of counseling at Marshall University, working with the Handle with Care initiative. As she said, it's being rolled out in parts of West Virginia. The idea being if something happens in a home that involves police officers, you know, the police get called out for a fight or some kind of violence or an accident or something, a child's school would then be notified. So if that child shows up, they're not getting punished because of those different emotional responses or they're not being punished maybe because they don't have their homework or something. It's basically about communicating better between police and the schools. It's an interesting idea and one that I wanted to bring to you this morning. Before we take the break, let's go to Gary in Charleston. Gary, what's up this morning? Uh, good morning, Shauna. Yeah, I just had a comment. I thought uh, it was interesting that the uh, uh, fellow that you had on earlier uh, that was uh, putting out the uh, judicial hellhole report. Mm -hmm. When you asked him about the uh, opposition to it, I, I believe uh, his quote was, how do you argue with an op-ed? And I thought that was very revealing uh, because what an op-ed is an opinion piece. Mm -hmm. And what this judicial hellhole report is, it's, it's the, they poll the opinions of lawyers who defend corporations mm -hmm. against <clears throat> citizens that are injured uh, uh, by their products and things like that. I, I work with a group called West Virginia Citizen Action, mm -hmm. and um, we think it's important to keep the courthouse doors open to uh, uh, citizens and consumers uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that have been harmed by defective products or malpractice or workplace injuries. Uh, we think that, you know, w that we should have all our constitutional rights uh, to go to court and seek uh, damages for uh, things when, when uh, people have been injured or have been wronged in some way. So, uh, of course, the, the corporations uh, don't like this. They don't like to be sued. Um, they well, like to sue does, each other Gary? a lot. Yeah, That's why they want the appellate court. Is, uh, they, they, they want to be able to sue each other, uh, but they don't like to be sued. Gary, thank you for the phone call. Our number, 1-800-765-8255, 1-800-765-TALK. Let's go to Terry. Terry, do you, do you want to weigh in on the judicial hellhole list today? Uh, yeah. How are you this morning? Good. What's up? Hey, uh, we have a rumor going around over in Pendleton County that the uh, Navy base may be turned into a Syrian uh, uh, place for them to bring the uh, refugees over. I'm going to check that. Anything? I have not heard that. I will check on that. Thank you, Terry, for the phone call this morning. 1-800-765-8255, 1-800-765-TALK. I have heard nothing about that out of the Metro News newsroom or anything like that. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue with Metro News Talk Line. Talk a little Shepherd football after this. West Virginia has balanced its budget on the back of the coal industry ever since we became a state 150 years ago. Historically, the coal industry and coal-fired electric utilities have accounted for over 60% of all business taxes. While high energy wages contribute a disproportionate share of income taxes and coal severance dollars sustain important programs in all counties. All told, the industry infuses over $26 billion to our state's economy. Coal alone has paid down nearly a billion dollars of the state's workers' compensation debt. 
Consequently, all state businesses have experienced major reductions in workers' comp benefits. The coal industry has always supported our people and our economy, but it's under attack from the Obama administration and the EPA. It's fighting to survive. Coal taxes in West Virginia are higher than our surrounding states. We're losing coal markets to our neighbors. Let's get our mines and coal miners working again. Support a reduced tax rate for mining. Paid for by West Virginia Coal Association. Stupid pipe! Oh no. Honey, are you all right? There's a time and a place to do things yourself, but there are some things that should be left to the professionals. When it comes to building your dream home, remodeling the bathroom, rewiring the kitchen, or fixing the furnace, you need the best help and the best materials you can get. That's when you need to go to the Home Builders Association of West Virginia. Their members are skilled professionals and retailers specializing in your home. It's your home. Don't settle for anything less than the best. Contact the Home Builders Association of West Virginia online at hbawv.org for a list of of licensed professionals and suppliers in your area. Go to hbawv.org today. This message brought to you by our marketing partners, Lowe's of North Central West Virginia, Brick Street, 84 Lumber, Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh, ProBuild, SJ Neathog, Valcon, Wincor, and West Virginia Housing Development Fund. The Home Builders Association of West Virginia. Go to hbawv.org today. This is Talkline on Metro News. For 30 years, the voice of West Virginia. Statistics show that 80% of auto fatalities occur close to home on rural roads. Gosh, cops. That's why law enforcement is stepping up rural patrols and cracking down on impaired driving. If you are over the limit, you are under arrest because drinking and driving don't mix. Remember, over the limit, under arrest. This message brought to you by the Governor's Highway Safety Program. At MVB Bank, we have one simple objective, to give you the very best of everything you could possibly want and need in a bank. That's it. We believe most people just want a really great bank with top-notch products, like checking with cash back, nationwide ATM fee refunds, great CD and car loan rates, and more. Together with our awesome team and the convenience of state-of-the-art technology they can count on. It's no extra fluff, just good, honest banking. We're MVB Bank, your most valuable bank. Member FDIC. Metro News Talk Line continues on this Thursday morning. I'm Shauna Johnson filling in today for Hoppy Kirchival. Hoppy is on vacation. Have no fear. He'll be back on Monday morning. Kyle Wicks is our producer this morning in Morgantown from judicial hell holes to handle with care. Now to a little football for you this morning. The Shepherd University football team may be in Kansas City already preparing for Saturday's NCAA Division II championship game against Northwest Missouri State. B.J. Pumroy is the Director of Athletics at Shepherd University, and he joins us this morning here on Metro News Talk Line. Good morning, B.J. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Shauna. Thanks for having me on. Has the team made it to Kansas City? Yeah, we flew uh, last night. Uh, we flew out of Dulles. Uh, the plane took off oh, a little bit uh, after 7, uh, and then we landed in Kansas City about 9.30 uh, Central Time and went to the hotel, and they had a great reception for us. Uh, when we got off the plane, we are our host uh, providers uh, actually uh, they had their sons with them and their sons were probably all about 8 to 12 years old and they helped unload the plane and pack it on the bus and 
went straight from the bus to the hotel and we had pizzas ready and waiting for us and check-in process was seamless and you know they've got the Marriott in downtown Kansas City dressed up with some they're not quite laser light shows but the projections of the championship trophies and different things and the outside of the hotel they do a light show where they besides Christmas lights they got a pretty good football uh, showing out towards the rest of the community so uh, it's been a, a wonderful experience I can look in the kids eyes and know that they're really getting a championship experience as we've come to KC. What does it mean to the program to be in the championship game coming up on Saturday? Uh, Sean it's it's uh, still kind of indescribable uh, which is bad for radio I guess but, um, <laughs> <laughs> the you know the whole idea of Shepherds had a very strong football program uh, you know since the 1970s and and 2010, we were fortunate to make the final four round, and uh, you know we're one game away from the championship. And uh, you know this opportunity is coming to us. Uh, you know, in essence, in the backyard of our opponent, so that's always going to make it a little more uh, challenging. Um, but uh, the overall opportunity for the institution to you know have the uh, worldwide coverage from uh, ESPN for both the semifinal and on the championship, as well as just the invigoration of the campus and community uh, in the area and hopefully statewide uh, with WB Metro News providing a link to folks to listen in uh, to cover us from, as you say, from Martinsburg to Maquan. How are the team members and the coaches doing? Is everyone getting a little nervous at this point? I haven't seen that nervousness yet. I just saw, I mean, from the plane to the bus, the hotel, I saw college kids being college kids. You know, they're, they're excited. They're uh, friendly, they're they. I don't know if the idea of playing on the grand stage has really hit them, and you know, pretty much, I'm not sure that has hit them in any of the games this year. I think it's been a pretty even keeled uh, kind of team, and um, we'll see when the bright lights shine. But uh, just from knowing some of the personalities, I don't think uh, folks are going to get uh, any tighter just because they feel like they're playing in a championship. So, what does Shepard have to do to win on Saturday? Well, on Saturday, they're going to have to limit the mistakes, uh, have few penalties, um, be a little more productive in the uh, return game. We've done very well with that throughout the year, and that kind of dropped off a little bit during the playoffs. Uh, be balanced on offense and defense with our run game, which really shown well last week against Grand Valley. Um, you know, our quarterback is still uh, a tenable situation. We're not sure if um, – you know, Harlan Hill finalist Jeff Samba is going to be able to go or is very capable backup Connor Jessup. And defensively, like we like to each week, so we want to try to make Northwest Missouri one-dimensional. Uh, they get in the position where they can only throw the ball. I like our eight uh, defensive linemen that rotate four and four. I like them getting a chance to pressure and attack the quarterback. And what kind of fan contingent are you expecting? Uh, we're hoping we get about 1,000 fans here. Uh, I know uh, when we picked up the tickets Yesterday, we were uh, just under 700, so we still hope we get some more people uh, who are making the trip out, and they'll just purchase when they get here. But uh, the stadium seats, I believe, uh, over 16,000, and they're expecting a sellout for the day. It'll be the largest uh, attended NCAA Division II football championship in the history of the event. And Northwest, well, and Northwest, Northwest Missouri is about an hour away, right? Yeah, about more like an hour and a half. But, okay. uh, yeah, that's going to have a big deal to it. I mean, to equate uh, to... Um, you know, uh, folks from across the state, it would be like if the Mountaineers were playing LSU for the national championship, but it is being held in New Orleans. That's a good way to say it. B.J. Pomeroy, yeah. Director of Athletics for Shepherd University. Good luck on Saturday. We'll be listening here at home, okay? Thank you, Shauna. Have Kick a great day. You too. Kickoff set for 4 p.m. at Sporting Park in Kansas City on Saturday. The NCAA Division II Championship Game, Shepherd University, Northwest Missouri State. The first trip to the championship game for the Rams. Metro News will bring you radio coverage of the game with Travis Jones and Rasheed Marshall. You can hear it on stations throughout the state and also at WVMetroNews.com. Talk line continues after this. True to its motto, wild and wonderful, West Virginia is the third most forested state in the country for landmass and has 7 million more forested acres now than 100 years ago. The Mountain State is abundantly blessed with valuable renewable forest resources, which naturally regenerate for future generations. Forestry is the basis for over 5,000 separate wood and paper products, creating millions of dollars in state revenue from business income and property taxes. A message from the West Virginia Forestry Association, WVFA.org. A study from England shows that men, men spend more time each day looking at themselves than women. Well, believe that study or not, the point is we all want to look our best all the time. Well, the same holds true for businesses. We judge businesses, in fact, by their look. At Pikewood Creative, we produce videos and commercials that make businesses look their very best. And you know what? It improves their business. They get more customers and clients. 
If you'd like your business to look better, then check us out at pipewoodcreative.com. You're listening to Talkline on Metro News. For 30 years, the voice of West Virginia. Statistics show that 80% of auto fatalities occur close to home on rural roads. Cops. That's why law enforcement is stepping up rural patrols and cracking down on impaired driving. If you are over the limit, you are under arrest because drinking and driving don't mix. Remember, over the limit, under arrest. This message brought to you by the Governor's Highway Safety Program. At MVB Bank, we have one simple objective, to give you the very best of everything you could possibly want and need in a bank. That's it. We believe most people just want a really great bank with top-notch products, like checking with cash back, nationwide ATM fee refunds, great CD and car loan rates, and more, together with our awesome team and the convenience of state-of-the-art technology they can count on. It's no extra fluff, just good, honest banking. We're MVB Bank, your most valuable bank. Member FDIC. The Downtown Charleston Art Walk takes place Thursday. This free self-guided walking tour takes visitors through some of Charleston's favorite galleries, stores, and businesses, enjoy shopping, refreshments, and mingling, along with a variety of art from paintings and sculptures to photography and music. Real creative spirit, you'll find it here, wild, wonderful West Virginia. A busy first hour here on Metro News Talk Line coming up next hour. We'll go to Marshall University, where this morning the bells have been ringing as a tribute to late Marshall President Stephen Cobb. Cobb died a year ago today. The new president at Marshall University begins in the new year. We'll speak next hour with interim president Gary White. Also, it's a wonderful life as a radio play. We'll bring you that story. And right after the break, we'll go to Union Elementary School and Buchanan to learn what they're doing to get their students to start thinking at a very young age about careers and colleges. All that and much more coming up. Also, we are watching the State Board of Education meeting and Senate President Bill Cole and House Speaker Tim Armstead holding a news conference here in a few minutes about the judicial hellhole report. Metro News is there. We'll bring you more. This is Talkline on Metro News. For 30 years, the voice of West Virginia. Statistics show that 80% of auto fatalities occur close to home on rural roads. Cops. That's 
while law enforcement is stepping up rural patrols and cracking down on impaired driving. If you are over the limit, you are under arrest because drinking and driving don't mix. Remember, over the limit, under arrest. This message brought to you by the Governor's Highway Safety Program. At MVB Bank, we have one simple objective.
Hour number two of Metro News Talk Line here on the Metro News Radio Network in and around West Virginia. Also streaming online at WVMetroNews.com, WVMetroNews.com. My name is Shauna Johnson. I'm filling in today for Hoppy Kerchival, who's on vacation. Hoppy's back on Monday morning. And he will be ready to go, I am sure. Coming up later in the program, we'll go to Marshall University, where the bells have been ringing this morning. We'll tell you why. Also, we bring It's a Wonderful Life to the radio with sound effects. That could work out to be pretty cool if I get the microphone set up correctly. And as always, your phone calls and comments. 1-800-765-8255. 1-800-765-8255. Or send me a tweet. That's the best way to get to me. At Shauna JWV. At Shauna JWV. That is the best way to get to me if you do not want to speak on the radio. Right now, I'd like to introduce you to a couple of educators out of Upshur County. I've been hearing about some of the things they are doing to get their students thinking about colleges and careers early. We're going to Union Elementary School in Buchanan right now. To speak with Dr. Sarah Stankus, the principal of Union Elementary School. Good morning, Dr. Stankus. Welcome to the program. Good morning. And also this morning, Destiny McCourt, a third grade teacher there at Union. Good morning, Destiny. Hello. Dr. Stankus, well, I want to start with you. I've been hearing just so many things about what Union is doing. And you have students K through fifth. Am I right about that? That's right. A small school, 324 students and why why put such a focus on, okay, let's get going now. Let's start thinking about what we want to be when we grow up. Well, we know there are many families who are first-generation college going in West Virginia, so we like to have those conversations that may not take place in every home. So we talk a lot about the future and dreaming big, and uh, regardless of what the students are facing in their current situation, we want them to begin to think about a great future. You can be anything you want to be, right? Right. Destiny, what, walk us through. What are some things that you're doing in your classroom? You have career day, but you kind of take a different approach to it? Yes. So in th- third grade, we set up the career day, and the students are the ones who send out letters to all of the different people and asking them if they can come into our class or into our school and uh, share what it is that they do and we try to get a lot of different kinds of careers. So we, so the students know it's not just college, but they can also have a career in mind. So we've had a member of the Peace Corps come and present. We have had police officers and firemen, lawyers, surgeons. So we try to have all of these different options so the students know that there are options. And what do you do for Halloween? Well, in third grade for Halloween, instead of the students just dressing up in in a normal Halloween costume, the weeks leading up to Halloween, we start doing research on the career of what we want to be when we grow up. So for our Halloween party, the students present who it is they are going to be when they grow up and the different facts about that, and they dress up as that career. So we always take a picture and then make a bulletin board afterwards that says something like, class of 2024 with the picture of them dressed up as who they want to be when they grow up. Dr. Stankus, this is something that people start doing in high school. Why, why so young? <clears throat> well, again, we know that um, middle class families have a lot more opportunities to talk about the future and, and some families who are more focused on those day-to-day challenges of life may really have less opportunity or be less likely to talk about those future possibilities. So we believe if we can help in some small way to help grow that dream, um, this will impact our entire community, and it really impacts students in a way that um, really increases their likelihood of having a great future. So you, that's, you have students that's kind of going, what we're doing. You have students doing college visits at the elementary school level? Every class in our school, from kindergarten to fifth grade, they visit a college campus or they visit um, a technical school. So we go to that campus, the students eat in the cafeteria, and that's always their favorite part. (laughs) And uh, they come home with um, different uh, artifacts from the college, and many of our students will have um, 
those banners hanging up in their bedrooms, and we believe that has a great impact on on them dreaming about going to college. That's Dr. Sarah Stankus, principal at Union Elementary School in Buchanan, also with us, Destiny McCord, a third grade teacher at the school. Destiny, explain to us how you do classroom seating in your classroom at the third grade level. So we have our class, our, our seats in groups, and above each group, we'll name each group a different college. So the students will apply, after we do some research on the colleges, they'll apply for which college they want to sit at. And part of their college application is an essay where they write about why do they want to attend that college. And some students take the aspect of, I want to go to uh, Wesleyan because it is a local college for us. And some say, I want to go to Marshall University because it's closer to the board. So it's interesting to see how they take into account their future stories for that. Is and one we've college, had a lot, I might add that we've had a lot of support from CFWV. They send us all kinds of things from the different colleges. And also we're a professional development school with Glenville State College. And West Virginia Wesleyan College sends their students in to Union Elementary. So we are seeing those college students and interacting with them a lot. What's CFWV? That is College Foundation of West Virginia. And um, we, we do a lot of things. Um, one of the things that we do here at our school is we offer scholarships. Our, our students raise money to offer scholarships for our union alumni. So when a union elementary student graduates from high school, last year we were able to give away three $500 scholarships to students who went to school here. And that's just our way of saying we believe in you. We think you have a bright future. And um, if and those students come to the school, the students who win the scholarships, and they share their stories with our elementary students and tell them, you know, I was just like you one day, but look at me now. Destiny, where did you go to school? I went to college at West Virginia Wesleyan. And when did you know you wanted to go to Wesleyan? I, I applied for several different schools, but then I decided that Wesleyan was more for me because it was the smaller uh, kind of community, and um, I grew up here in Buchanan as well, and I had a lot of help through Upward Bound. I was a student in Upward Bound, and they helped me with applying for the scholarships and helping me figure out what I wanted with my life. We're talking with Dr. Sarah Stankus, the principal at Union Elementary School in Buchanan, also Destiny McCord, a third grade teacher there. I'm bringing this to you as the listeners this morning, just as an example of what some schools are doing to get students thinking about colleges and careers early on. I want you guys to talk about, and I guess we'll start with you, Destiny, how, how are you teaching students not just reading, writing, arithmetic, but you're also teaching social skills to your students, social skills? Yes. So I think a lot of, and most teachers could probably tell you that we're not, it's not just all academic, it's a lot of social and life skills as well. So when the students come into my classroom every morning, we practice shaking hands. And they, they've learned it has to be a firm handshake, making that eye contact and um, smiling. And at the end of the day, they will also shake my hand and we have another student who is a greeter as well. And uh, that really helps with building that leadership and that confidence in them. And they even practice Stephen Covey's seven habits. So they can learn, you know, I need to be proactive with my life. I need to begin with the end in mind. It's funny. Some parents say uh, our, our students are coming home and they're telling their parents, hey, mom, dad, um, let's think win-win. How can you get what you want and I get what I want? And the parents are saying, okay, where did you come up with this? <laughs> yeah, from a second grader, I would be like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How? Uh, who's teaching you these things? <laughs> well, those are important skills because so much today we're in our phones or we're not really paying attention and everything is texting and online, even, even at the elementary school age level, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we're just, we're just really, uh, we love doing the work that we do, and we know how important it is for our children to understand that they, they do have bright futures. And this strong foundation that we build in elementary school 
just begins that growth for middle and high school and beyond because we know that they're with us for six years, but more importantly, um, they're going to be living life for a lot longer. So that's kind of what we want to do is have this growth mindset and, and really change communities and have a bright future in West Virginia. Dr. Sarah Stankus, principal of Union Elementary School, Destiny McCord, a third grade teacher there. Thank you both for your time this morning. The folks over at the Higher Education Policy Commission, I think they saw you at a student success summit, heard you speak, yes. and they were just just amazed at some of the things you said, and it was really inspirational for them. And so they reached out to me and said I needed to talk to you, and they were not wrong. So thank you for your time <laughs> this morning. Thank you thank so you. much. It's been an honor. Have a good holiday. Dr. Sarah Stankus, Destiny McCourt from Union Elementary School in Buchanan. Just one example of some of the things happening in one of West Virginia schools to get students thinking, to get them thinking about college and careers. We'll take a break here on Metro News Talk Line. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about a tribute today on Marshall University's campus. That's after this when Metro News Talk Line continues. We're in the spirit of giving at MVB Bank this year, and our gift to you includes awesome CD products at great rates, like our 58-month 2.12 annual percentage yield CD. You can start saving today with a minimum deposit of just $1,000. Hurry in now and avoid the holiday rush. This is a present that keeps on earning year after year. MVB Bank, your financial life made easy. Member FDIC. Visit us at mvbbanking.com. A charity that's close to hearts and close to home. Burlington United Methodist Family Services has been changing lives by preventing harm and providing hope and healing to hurting West Virginia children and families for over 100 years. When you make a charitable contribution to Burlington, you're not only reducing your own tax burden, but helping provide crucial services across our state. Learn more about Burlington and see how you can help today at BUMFS.org. Burlington United Methodist Family Services. This is TalkLine on Metro News. For 30 years, the voice of West Virginia. Statistics show that 80% of auto fatalities occur close to home on rural roads. Gosh, cops. That's why law enforcement is stepping up rural patrols and cracking down on impaired driving. If you are over the limit, you are under arrest because drinking and driving don't mix. Remember, over the limit, under arrest. This message brought to you by the Governor's Highway Safety Program. At MVB Bank, we have one simple objective, to give you the very best of everything you could possibly want and need in a bank. That's it. We believe most people just want a really great bank with top-notch products, like checking with cash back, nationwide ATM fee refunds, great CD and car loan rates, and more. Together with our awesome team and the convenience of state-of-the-art technology they can count on. It's no extra fluff, just good, honest banking. We're MVB Bank, your most valuable bank. Member FDIC. Metro News Talk Line continues on this Thursday morning. I'm Shona Johnson. I'm filling in today for Hoppy Kirchival. Hoppy's on vacation. He's back on Monday morning. My regular gig is from 6 to 9 a.m. The morning news heard here on the Metro News Radio Network. I'm also a reporter, and I spent roughly two months of this year covering the trial of former Massey Energy CEO Don Blankenship. The bells have been ringing today at Marshall University. 
It's a tribute to someone who really left his mark on Marshall University. For more, we bring in Marshall Interim President Gary White. Good morning, President White. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good so, morning. So 10 a.m. this morning, 10 bells. Well, the bells rang 10 times. Why in Huntington? Well, that commemorates the, the roughly 10 years of service that Marshall University had under the leadership of Dr. Stephen Kopp. And uh, we, we thought it would be appropriate to, uh, to commemorate those many years of service. Today marks one year since President Kopp died, and I still remember that day when we got the news. It was many people, most people couldn't believe it, and I'm wondering if you've had time to process it in the year plus, or does it just seem like yesterday? Well, of course, it was a tragic event, and it's uh, any time that any of us experience the tragic loss of a dear friend, uh, we tend to remember where we were and what we were doing. Uh, but as the year has progressed, I think it's fair to say there has been naturally a healing process. But there's an impression that is left in, in, in the institution and in the minds of those who knew and worked with Dr. Kopp uh, that, that will last for our lifetime. And, uh, uh, you know, it was 10 years of, of great service. And, and I think the other thing that's important for the folks to understand is, is Dr. Kopp and, and Mrs. Kopp, Jane, adopted West Virginia. Uh, they came here uh, from the state of Ohio. They were born in other states, but they made the decision that they were going to spend the rest of, of their life in West Virginia. They had purchased property here. They were getting ready. In fact, in the spring, they were getting ready to break ground on their on their retirement home and and so they made a major commitment to us and and of course uh, the leadership of Dr. Kopp is evident to anyone who drives through or spends any time on our campus or knows anything about what's going on with Marshall University. Just to drive on campus and to see what changed in the 10 years he was there buildings and you know just a just a different even vibe in some ways. Well, that's correct. You know, Dr. Kopp, by training, was a scientist. Um, he had spent a short period of time as a provost but before he came to Marshall University. And I think, I think it's very fair, and I think if he were here, he would agree. He grew in his professional uh, stature uh, during his tenure. <clears throat> excuse me, during his ten tenure at Marshall University. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's evidence in the building. But it's also evidenced in in the persona of Marshall University, who we are and who we're going to be. Traditionally, uh, a lot of emphasis in the in the liberal arts and in the humanities, and he saw that as a as an important component upon which to build the future. And that's where uh, you know the biotech center, the the Weisberg Engineering facility the beautiful visual arts center downtown Huntington, all of those were part of his vision uh, to take the, the very strong and fundamental uh, foundation of Marshall University and develop into the, next, into the next level of education to provide the education that's needed by the, by the students that we serve. New Marshall President Dr. Jerry Gilbert is set to start in the new year. What are your hopes for him as you wrap up your time as interim president? Well, I think it's fair to say that uh, we, we are excited, of course, about having Dr. Gilbert join us. But if you look at Dr. Gilbert's educational background, if you look at his more than 20 years at uh, Mississippi State University, you would see that Dr. Gilbert is going to step right in, pick up with the direction that Dr. Kopp uh, had, had set, the course that he had set, and, and really take that to the next level based on his significant experience uh, in, in, in this, the STEM areas. But if you paid attention to any of the remarks that he's made uh, since it was announced that he would be the next president, you will see that he's very careful uh, to talk about the integration of the of the fundamentals of the humanities at Marshall University, coupled with the STEM, so that 
the student who graduates from Marshall University will be well grounded in the humanities and have the science and math and and all the STEM uh, uh, training uh, to go along with that and make a very well-rounded, very employable individual, if you will. So w- we think we think he's a he's a perfect fit. We're we're very pleased uh, with the process that we went through and obviously the the individual that was ultimately selected. Marshall University Interim President Gary White, thank you so much for your time and thanks for talking to us over the past year while serving as interim. It's been my pleasure and particularly today I appreciate you uh, devoting a segment to, to, to the memory of Dr. Kopp, our dear friend. Thank you, President White. I appreciate it this morning. Ten, ten o'clock this morning, the bells rang ten times in Huntington at Marshall University's campus there in honor of President Stephen Kopp. His nearly ten years of service to Marshall, he died a year ago today. That was earlier this morning that the bells rang out over campus there. Right now, I want to let you know that the State Board of Education is continuing its meeting, and we have a reporter there, Carrie Hudasek, and we're watching to see what the board is going to do today because on the agenda would be the replacement standards for Common Core, the education standards in West Virginia. Now, in, in West Virginia, the Common Core standards are called Next Generation. I'm going to say standards many times in the coming minutes. I'll just warn you right now. So we know there was a lot of pushback against Common Core. State School Superintendent Dr. Michael Martirano, he responded. He is now recommending that those Common Core standards be repealed and be replaced with the West Virginia College and Career Readiness Standards for English and Math. These are the standards that came after a series of public hearings and public input. And there's also a public comment period that wrapped up earlier this week. The State Board of Education is expected to vote, if not today, by tomorrow morning on those standards. And I can tell you earlier in the week, the president of the State Board of Education, Mike Green, sat down with some leading state lawmakers. There are some Republican lawmakers, leading lawmakers, who still have some issues with the contents of these West Virginia College and Career Readiness Standards. I tried a couple of times to get those lawmakers to come on and also they're not really ready to talk until they see what the State Board of Education does. Also, Mike Green had put out a statement saying only that he listened because he wants to make informed recommendations to the State Board today. So once we see if the State Board of Education adopts these standards as is, I anticipate there may be some kind of legislative response You know, lawmakers may attempt to revise those standards in the upcoming regular legislative session. I'm not sensing that there is full support for what is being proposed. So we're watching to see what the State Board of Education does today. And there, I mean, we call them standards over and over again. Basically, this is what students in West Virginia should know by when. So that's what's going on at the State Board meeting. Bottom of the hour break, this is talk line and oh bottom of the hour break will continue after this. This is talk line on Metro News for 30 years, the voice of West Virginia. It's eleven thirty. That means it's time for a news update. For that we go to the Metro News anchor desk in Charleston for the latest on this Thursday. West Virginia Metro News, I'm Jeff Jenkins. State Senate President Bill Cole, House of Delegate Speaker Tim Armstead are holding a news conference this hour at the state capitol, praising the report out this morning that removes West Virginia from the judicial hellhole list. The Republican legislative leaders led an effort earlier this year to pass more than a dozen pieces of judicial reform legislation. The American Tort Reform Association puts out the list. Group President Tiger Joyce was a guest earlier today on Metro News Talk Line. These reflect... Uh, balanced uh, uh, reforms uh, that reflect the the priorities of, of the citizens of the state and bring about needed reform. But the State Trial Lawyers Association says the report's a joke. President Paige Flanagan says West Virginia is still on a watch list. We have been on this list for over a decade. And so being on a watch list is really no different than being listed as the judicial hellhole. Um, It continues. Flanagan says it's eroding the legal rights of citizens. If he had to take a vote right now, West Virginia 1st District Congressman David McKinley says he would not be in favor of the spending bill up for a vote in the House Friday. McKinley says that he's not alone. I think it's going to wind up the... uh 
majority of, the, of uh, members of the House are, uh, could very well be voting against it, or at least on the Republicans. Now, U.S. Senator Joe Manchin is scheduled to make a speech later this hour on the floor of the U.S. Senate against part of that spending bill. You're listening to Metro News for 30 years, the voice of West Virginia. Business owners know it's hard to find quality employees. If your business is growing and you need to hire trained, eager staff, Metro News can help with a recruitment campaign. If you need professionals or skilled tradespeople, if you're having a job fair or are searching for a uniquely qualified person for a special position, Metro News is ready to help you execute a successful campaign. Best of all, Metro News can broadcast your search statewide or narrow it to a certain region. For more information on how Metro News can help your employee recruit be successful. Call Joe Parsons at 304-346-7055, 304-346-7055, or email jparsons at wvmetronews.com. That's jparsons at wvmetronews.com. Metro News and your business working together to elevate our state's economy and make your company a success. Call 304-346-7055 or email jparsons at wvmetronews.com. A somber few moments last hour on the campus of Marshall University when bells rang out in honor of the memory of former Marshall President Stephen Kopp. He died a year ago today. The largest private company offering workers' compensation insurance in West Virginia is giving $700,000 to Bridge Valley Community and Technical College. The presentation will take place this afternoon in South Charleston. Brick Street Insurance says that money will be used for scholarships. From the Metro News Anchor Desk, I'm Jeff Jenkins. Metro News Talk Line continues on this Thursday morning. I'm Shauna Johnson filling in today for Hoppy Kirchival. Coming up later in the hour, a former West Virginia University football player joins us to talk about what he's doing to help get some toys to some needy kids this holiday season. Also, we'll bring you any updates as we get them from the meeting of the State Board of Education. Right now, I want to tell you about a production, a holiday production that's happening at the Alban Theater, which is in St. Albans in Kanawha County. It's a wonderful life, a live radio play. There are three more showings coming up tomorrow and Saturday at 8 p.m. and also Sunday at 2 p.m. The idea being to take It's a Wonderful Life, that story we know so well about the angel coming down to show a man why his life is so important and, and staging it, but staging it as a live radio Play. Marley Carter is, well, she's a crucial part of that production because she handles all of the sound effects. Almost all of the sound effects, yes. And so how you brought a little bit of your arsenal over there. <laughs> it's quite the, extensive. Well, I brought all my bells and whistles for you, but uh, some of the larger things I had to leave at the theater. So, it, so what's your official title? Sound effects specialist? It's actually a Foley artist. If you sit in the movie and watch the credits all the way through, you'll eventually see a Foley artist come up, and they're the person who manufactures the sound effects that are dubbed in. A Foley artist. Mm -hmm. And how did you get into this? Um, I had done it before for uh, Charleston Stage Company's production of Shipwrecked mm -hmm. several years ago. Um, but this one, I was the assistant director already on it, so I decided I would take over this interesting and fun challenge. So does the story follow the 1946 film, George Bailey wishes he'd never been born, the angel is sent to Earth to make his wish come true or to help him realize how many lives he's changed and impacted? Is that the general story we're going? It's, it's the exact same story as the Frank Capra film. It has all the same very memorable lines in it. It's just presented as a radio production. So that means the actors are standing there with scripts? They are, but they are presenting it as a radio studio in 1946. Okay. So they are in full costume, and they are presenting certain actors, and they do have uh, things they do that are part of the radio production, but... It's as the characters of George Bailey and Mary Bailey and Clarence. So give me an example of what you're doing while they're going. Well, what I'm doing is um, 
when you are out in public, you hear all these noises and you filter them out. But if you heard somebody walking towards you and they didn't have footsteps, you'd be alarmed. It's a vampire, right? But um, so much of the of the early radio plays used large amounts of sound effects. For instance, if you think about, what, WCHS? The old radio chimes. Um, when you're stirring your coffee in the morning, it makes a distinctive noise. And in order to tell a radio play, you have to have background noises, otherwise it just sounds like somebody is reading. So you're doing that, you're busy the whole time? I am incredibly busy the entire time. We have different sound effects like the different bells, like Mr. Gower's drugstore. And cash registers. And this is actually a bicycle bell. It is? And when you you do it just once, it sounds like an old cash register. That's pretty neat. Um, Things like old car horns. Not the modern ones that you hit the steering wheel, but <laughs> um, George gets slapped when he's young by Mr. Gower, and to do that, we use a belt just like Daddy did. That was serious. I think um, I just got nervous about that one. I know. It's a little <laughs> frightening. Um, things like um, 1946, everybody smoked. So while the play is going on. Interesting. Is there, uh, there's no smoking on stage, though. They are using fake cigarettes. They're prop cigarettes. They have no actual smoke. It's like cornstarch or something that's coming out of them. What are the playing cards for? The playing cards are when George loses the $8,000 that sends him into that panic that he's going to commit suicide, um, they count it. Oh, okay. That's pretty smart. And um, things like a police whistle. I'm not going to do it right into the microphone. I don't want to alarm people. (laughs) Yeah, that might be my favorite one. Oh, no, no. This is your favorite right here. I don't even know what that is. This is a hand crank siren. We use this for um, when they're talking about when George was in the war. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, that's my favorite. Yes, you're right. <laughs> so do you have all of this, or did you have to get stock specifically for this live radio production? Well, we went we went through, and we had to purchase some things, um, like the siren. It's not something that's common anymore. I had to build a wind machine, which was very fun. Wind machines used to be very common in most theaters in order to make the sound effect of wind and it just works by it looks like an open work barrel that's turned on a crank oh really yeah that seems difficult to manufacture no well yes (laughs) (laughs) um but uh it's something that most theaters had before we had playback and tapes and things and we can do fun things like i'm holding a comb right now and if I want to make it sound like crickets. Oh, let me try. Is it is it as easy as it looks? Maybe not. Hold on, hold on. I don't know. It sounds like a comb to me. Well, and I can make it tick like a clock, too. I'm just sitting here amazed. That's really fun. How did you get into this? Um, In college, you have to sort of study this academically because it's really ancient in the past kind of stuff. Um, But it's it's an interesting art form because you think about everything you see in movies, and they always, always have a person that is making these extra sound effects. It's like when they have, and this is gory, but when they break an arm or something in the big action films, Mm -hmm. somebody will stand there with a stalk of celery and crunch it. Really? Yeah. That's the breaking arm sound? Yeah, that's is the breaking ring? arm sound. I didn't know that. We're talking with Marley Carter. She does sound effects for It's a Wonderful Life, a live radio play. You can see it tomorrow night, Saturday night, and also Sunday afternoon at the Alban Theater in St. Albans in Kanawha County. We're going to take a break. We're going to talk to somebody with the Allen Creek Fire Department, do something a little different, but we'll continue our con- conversation with Marley and also... I'm going to try to get into her stash of things that she uses for sound effects. 
So we'll take a break here on Metro News Talk Line and continue after this. Look around your holiday table this year and think, how many faces are missing because they've had to leave home to find good jobs in more technology-driven, economically diverse states? The High Technology Foundation is working to keep young, educated West Virginians here at home by attracting high-tech companies to our state. The High Technology Foundation is helping build stronger West Virginia families by building a stronger West Virginia because there's no place like home and family for the holidays. Learn more at WVHTF.org. In this season of giving, consider donating your used vehicle to Good News Mountaineer Garage. You'll get the best tax deduction possible and the satisfaction of knowing your donation changed the life of someone in need. Good News Mountaineer Garage repairs donated vehicles and provides them to qualified West Virginia families, giving them access to employment, safe, affordable housing, health care, and other vital necessities, and putting them on the road to economic independence. Call 1-866-GIVE-CAR today for Good News Mountaineer Garage. 866-GIVE-CAR. You're listening to TalkLine on Metro News. For 30 years, the voice of West Virginia. Statistics show that 80% of auto fatalities occur close to home on rural roads. Cops. That's why law enforcement is stepping up rural patrols and cracking down on impaired driving. If you are over the limit, you are under arrest because drinking and driving don't mix. Remember, over the limit, under arrest. This message brought to you by the Governor's Highway Safety Program. At MVB Bank, we have one simple objective, to give you the very best of everything you could possibly want and need in a bank. That's it. We believe most people just want a really great bank with top-notch products, like checking with cash back, nationwide ATM fee refunds, great CD and car loan rates, and more. Together with our awesome team and the convenience of state-of-the-art technology they can count on. It's no extra fluff, just good, honest banking. We're MVB Bank, your most valuable bank. Member FDIC. Metro News Talk Line continues on this Thursday morning. I'm Shauna Johnson filling in today for Hoppy Kerchival. Hoppy's on vacation. He's back on Monday morning. We're talking with Marley Carter. She is working the sound effects for the production of It's a Wonderful Life, set for tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday at the Alban Theater in St. Albans, which is in Kanawha County. It's staged as a live radio play. We'll get back to her in just a moment, but right now I want to bring in former West Virginia University football player Ricky Sherrod. He's going to be in Kanawha County and Lincoln County later today to help the Alum Creek Volunteer Fire Department ramp up the third annual Christmas toy drive. Ricky, welcome to the program. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. What are you going to be doing today? You're out at Midway Elementary, 630 to 830, doing what? We're going to be out there, you know, uh, with the kids, uh, me and a couple of my teammates that we're going to go out there and you know bring in some toys for the kids hopefully take a few donations you know uh, see some people some fans talk a little sports uh, Santa will be out there also so hopefully it'll be a real good time so should people bring unwrapped gifts yeah they'll be donating toys will be uh, hopefully you know there'll be a lot of people dropping off some toys um, should be unwrapped or wrapped however they prefer um, you know, we're hands open to whatever they bring. Uh, we're just thankful to, you know, be a part of something, a function for the kids and to, to help out. 
Ricky, you played at WVU starting in 1998. What are you up to these days? Well, these days, you know, I still do a little bit of uh, sports training. Mm -hmm. um, I work mostly with uh, Moses Factory Outlet. I sell nice cars out there, and I do a little bit of sports training on the side, which eventually I think that I will get into coaching uh, or, you know, uh, pick up the sports training uh, pretty hard. But uh, what I do now is I basically work with uh, Moses Factory Outlet out there selling cars, and I work with a select few of individuals. Uh, in the world of football, you know, I do sports training with the youngsters, uh, I would say eight years old and up. So who's going to be out at the Alum Creek Fire Department today with you, the players? Uh, today I'll be bringing with me Alvin Swoop, who played running back. Uh, he alternated with Amos Zaraway. Uh, when Amos wasn't carrying the ball, he was. And Greg Robinette, one of the strongest Mountaineers ever to play there, played defensive line there and then played for the Cleveland Browns and a couple of other places. Uh, a good buddy of mine, Sean Andrew Davis, who walked on up there four years, played four years with us, uh, was a walk-on, did well, has his own business. Uh, also Brian Lewin, a former basketball player there with the same time I was there. Uh, he, he did real well. He played with the Harlem Globetrotters, and uh, he did well with them, played overseas. And uh, also, I believe that's it, Santa. Sounds Santa like a good there. list. Yeah, well, of course, Santa's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky Sherrod will be out at the Alum Creek Fire, Volunteer Fire Department for the third annual Christmas Toy Drive wrap-up party. It's not at the fire department itself. It's at Midway Elementary School from 6.30 until 8.30 tonight. Admission is a new unwrapped toy or a donation. Ricky, you have fun out there and tell Santa we said hi, okay? Sure will. Thanks for having me. Again, 6.30 until 8.30 tonight at Midway Elementary School to see those former WVU players and help out a great cause. The Allen Creek Volunteer Fire Department, third annual Christmas Toy Drive wrap-up party. Again, just to be clear, Midway Elementary, 6.30 until 8.30 is the location. We'll take one more break, and we'll come back. And I'm going to try to get this siren to go. And we'll continue with Marley Carter. More on It's a Wonderful Life when Metro News Talk Line continues. When you drive impaired in West Virginia, you break the law and endanger the lives of others. Law enforcement across the state is committed to keeping impaired drivers off the road. If you drive impaired, be prepared to pay the price. There are consequences. It's simple, West Virginia. Drive sober or get pulled over. You feel a strong desire to help hurting children and families in West Virginia, but you think... What could I do? Burlington United Methodist Family Services has a place for everyone. Folks to help with office duties in their facilities across the state. Professional and business people to help teach youth about their professions. Volunteers for their annual pumpkin and apple harvest festivals. And of course, donations of all kinds. What can you do? Search your heart and go to BUMFS.org today. BUMFS.org. Is your business or organization struggling when it comes time to tell your story? After all, your story is what makes you unique. Your story is what makes potential clients and customers draw themselves to you. Unfortunately, oftentimes, those stories aren't told and businesses and organizations remain mired in mediocrity. At Pikewood Creative, we produce videos and commercials in a way that make people take notice. If you need some visual help, then visit us at pikewoodcreative.com. This is Talkline on Metro News. For 30 years, the voice of West Virginia. Statistics show that 80% of auto fatalities occur close to home on rural roads. Gosh, cops. That's 
limits while law enforcement is stepping up rural patrols and cracking down on impaired driving. If you are over the limit, you are under arrest because drinking and driving don't mix. Remember, over the limit, under arrest. This message brought to you by the Governor's Highway Safety Program. At MVB Bank, we have one simple objective, to give you the very best of everything you could possibly want and need in a bank. That's it. We believe most people just want a really great bank with top-notch products, like checking with cash back, nationwide ATM fee refunds, great CD and car loan rates, and more. Together with our awesome team and the convenience of state-of-the-art technology they can count on. It's no extra fluff, just good, honest banking. We're MVB Bank, your most valuable bank. Member FDIC. The Downtown Charleston Art Walk takes place Thursday. This free self-guided walking tour takes visitors through some of Charleston's favorite galleries, stores, and businesses. Enjoy shopping, refreshments, and mingling, along with a variety of art, from paintings and sculptures to photography and music. Real creative spirit. You'll find it here, wild, wonderful West Virginia. Here in West Virginia, there are two great jackpot games you can play from the West Virginia Lottery. Powerball has drawings on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And Mega Millions has drawings on Tuesdays and Fridays. The Powerball jackpot is $202 million. And the Mega Millions jackpot is $85 million. As we close out the show on this Thursday, we have a few more minutes with Marley Carter. She is handling sound effects for the production of It's a Wonderful Life, a live radio play at the Alban Theater in St. Albans, which is in Kanawha County. There are three more shows, 8 o'clock tomorrow, 8 o'clock Saturday, 2 p.m. on Sunday. And Marley, I have to tell you, It's a Wonderful Life is a pretty downer of a story there for a while. It is, but it's, it's such a holiday classic because who doesn't get depressed during the holidays, really? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's a story about uh, overcoming so much of the pain in our lives and misfortune and no matter how much you have to deal with, you are important to the people around you. So how did you get involved in this? Well, I was originally the assistant director, and then um, we decided that we were going to do live sound effects included in the play. So we decided that, okay, we're going to get everything together, and everything has to sort of look like the 1940s, because that's when the play set in. And it's like I've got four cues for a telephone during the show mm -hmm. now have you ever been angry at somebody and been on the phone with them and then you hit that button on your cell phone in it's not the same it's not, it's the, not same. the same <laughs> it's not the same so when you are angry and you're slamming down the telephone it's got that extra noise that little ring on the end and um, that happens a few times during the show and I can make telephones ring with my mind. Okay. I can. At least that's what I tell the kids in the production because they don't know how this works. Um, but uh, all I have to do is I lift this little thing and I can make a phone ring. Oh, I'm glad you shut that off. You're going to have to answer it. That's my pet peeve, a ringing phone. <laughs> so the kids are amazed by that. What else are they amazed by? Um, I mean, they keep wanting to play with it, and I keep shooing them away, but I've got my handy-dandy little glockenspiel here, so every time Clarence talks... Clarence is the angel? Clarence is the angel who saves George from committing suicide. Do that again. Oh, it's fun. Please. Very nice. Is there glitter involved? Well, it's radio. It's a radio play. Oh, I play. wish there was glitter involved. Um, and, you know, it's like we've, there's a train in one scene, Mm -hmm. And I just have one of these fun little train whistles. And it's just... Where'd you get that? At a souvenir stand? Is a yeah, wooden... pretty much. That's what it looks like. Um, 
And we... You shouldn't buy that for other people's kids for the holidays, P.S. Yeah, yeah. That and and anything loud. Never. What's the dog? What's the little oh, dog the looking little dog, at me? No, this is, this is the bell at the end when every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. Aw. I thought the bell would be bigger for that crucial moment. Well, it's it's more about the noise. We wanted to find something that made that bright, clingy sound. And um, But there's one moment in the play where everybody laughs, and they're laughing at me. Why? Well, it's because I can cry like a baby. Okay. So in one scene, there has to be a baby cry. And so every time it happens, I lean over the microphone very gently, and I go, <laughs> How are you even doing that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh! When I was a kid, I would I would imitate people, and um, it's like um, not all of us can be Sean Connery and Wishlarishes. That was pretty good too. Who else can you do? Um, uh, well, it's uh, let me see. Uh, well, I can do a pretty good Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> Well, they, they found the right person for the sound effects where it's a wonderful life. Have we gone through all of the cool stuff over there? She, uh, Marley came in here with a box of stuff. I made her haul it down the steps. I didn't even offer to help. No, it's fine. Um, and I think, did I do all the cool things? I mean, there's, there's more cool stuff at the theater that I couldn't bring. I've got a 20-gallon bucket of water. What's that for? That's for when George and Clarence jump in the river. Okay. And I've got a big thunder sheet. At the theater. What's a thunder sheet? It's a big piece of metal. And you, you shake, shake it? it. And it makes that. Sounds like it's actually storming. Yeah. You know, you're smiling. You're having a blast with this show, oh, aren't it's, you? It's, it's, it's a ball. You just sit there and make all these little noises in the middle of the thing. And it just helps to tell the story better. Marley Carter there. It's a Wonderful Life. She's doing sound effects for It's a Wonderful Life, a live radio play at the Alban Theater in St. Alban. Show times are 8 o'clock tomorrow, 8 o'clock Saturday, and then 2 o'clock on Sunday. And it's set up like that live radio play for the people who've gone. I've heard from people who have gone to this show, and they say it's absolutely great. And it's a great place to go with the family. It's a great show for the family. Um, very, very young children might not understand it, but anything five and up. Well, they, we'll would be, they would be entertained by what you're doing. They're entertained, and they're entertained by the interactions of the actors as they're, as they're acting through the show. Marley Carter, It's a Wonderful Life at the Alban Theater. Thank you for coming in and Thank bringing you. in all of that stuff. It's been a pleasure. We're going to wrap up Metro News Talk Line for this Thursday. You can keep up with the news of the day by going to our website, wvmetronews.com, wvmetronews.com, at the website this morning. An update on an accident out of Hampshire County, a deadly accident in Hampshire County, leading to three deaths. Also more on the story we started the show off with, the American Tort Reform Association removing West Virginia from the judicial hellhole list. Thanks to producers Kyle Wiggs and Dave Wilson this morning. I appreciate your help. We'll come back to it one more time tomorrow. I'm Shauna Johnson, and this has been Talkline on Metro News. For 30 years, the voice of West Virginia.